Hello, this is John with Theology Ed. This is going to be the, be the beginning oof, of a new series. We'll call it the Mark of the Beast series or questions about the Mark of the Beast. And what I'm going to do is we're going to together try to understand the biblical Mark of the Beast. This is a topic that a lot of people study. People are studying eschatology all the time. Um, eschatology being the study of end times, things like the apocalypse, the prophetic passages in Daniel, um, in the history of redemption. Basically, everything is moving from uh, creation to the fall and then a, a process of redeeming uh, God's uncovering and unveiling his way of redeeming his people. And it's all moving towards the end, okay? Uh, full redemption in heaven and all of this. And, and in the history of redemption, we're you know currently in this period of the, the Christian era after Christ has lived on earth, died, rose, risen from the dead, and has ascended to heaven and re rules from heaven, reigns from heaven, while the church grows, expands, and experiences the, the ups and downs of church history as a part of this redemptive history. Uh, and it moves towards a period at the end of this that's going to be a millennium uh, and then the very end, the second coming of Christ. Okay, and we can fill in details and work on that. Okay, that's part of what we're going to be looking at. But in this period towards the end, okay, as we move closer to the end, we have... Uh, all these various events that have been prophesied in Scripture, including a beast with ten horns, then you have the two-horned beast, you have uh, two witnesses, and you, there, there's a number of things. This, the, the whore on the back of the beast, the whore of Babylon, all of this is described in Revelation uh, and you know uh, similar teachings. Uh, the same things are often referenced in different ways in other parts of Scripture as well. And so the mark of the beast is one element of that people study when they're studying biblical eschatology, this end times stuff, roughly. Okay, And what we're going to try to do is try to understand it. But to understand it, it's an interesting thing. To understand the mark of the beast, we're going to have to answer a lot of different questions. And I'm not going to do this as a, dogmat, a dogmatic theologian where I'm coming in and saying, here's what it is. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm the expert uh, and the authority here. Uh, and I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I want to do this as a, a uh, community that's humble. Okay. Uh, there's a, a humility, of course, doesn't mean that we need to not be confident that we're right about something. Uh, however, at the same time, it does, I think, require us to be humble about the topic as a general uh, and, and to, to acknowledge that there is no one walking this planet today that has mastered and understands everything in the book of Revelation. Okay? Um, and there are parts that are, are very difficult to understand. And even if we're getting them right, until we see it actually happen, it is, we're, we're probably in the category of being, if we're humble enough to be honest, <laughs> we're, we're dealing with degrees of confidence here. I'm very sure this is right. I'm fairly sure this is right. I suspect this is what this is referring to based on uh, parallel passages and Daniel and this other passage here in this place, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. And we're working towards understanding like that. And and the goal here is to, uh, in a piecemeal fashion, work through various questions that will help us narrow uh, uh, our, our focus, our understanding, gain greater understanding, and, and limit the possible correct answers, right? So let's start excluding things that are wrong and get closer to what is correct and then we can become a bit more uh, sure of what we're saying. And so along the way, we're going to be asking questions that uh, may be a bit surprising. 
Maybe things that people took for granted as obviously right turn out to be not right. Uh, maybe uh, there are questions that we should be asking that we're not even asking or haven't been asking. And just by asking the question, uh, we expose that we maybe made some mistakes along the way in our thinking. And um, that's, that's fine. That's good. That's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to understand. So let's go ahead and get started. The first question here is going to be, can someone with the mark of the beast be saved? Uh, note, as we go, we're going to have to get to questions like, what is the beast? Uh, how should we understand the beast? When does the beast show up? Uh, who is? Wh wh what do we make of the two distinct beasts in Revelation 13? Uh, how do they relate one to another? Uh, lots of other questions have, are, are, have to be asked in order to understand the mark of the beast. And that's why it's impossible to do everything in one, one video. But let's start with this simple question. Can someone with the mark of the beast be saved? The idea here is, if someone has the mark, whatever it is, is it possible for them to repent and be saved? Can they, after having the mark, be saved? And that's what we're going to look at right now. So first, let's just look at a couple of the main passages about the mark of the beast in Revelation. So, Revelation 13, 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six or six 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 okay so there is our first passage um, about the mark of the beast this is when the second beast in revelation 13 causes all to receive the mark of the first beast okay in regardless of status uh socioeconomic status rich poor uh small great free bond everybody uh, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, right? That's the idea. And it limits their ability to be a part of the economic system, the economy. They can't buy, they can't sell. Um, and this mark has other features as well. Um, in some way, when you get this mark, not only can you not buy or sell without it, uh, without the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You get these three phrases together. So you have a mark, a name, and a number, and they seem roughly interchangeable here, right? I mean, at first glance, we'll dig into that later, hopefully. And the number is the number of a man. Uh, so historically, and this has been, you know, this a consensus view is uh, the Apostle John, who wrote Revelation, is doing. Uh, gematria here. So uh, in Greek, Hebrew, in ancient languages, these ancient languages, classical languages, uh, you have every letter also corresponding to a number. And so when you have a, a name written, you can do some gematria and calculate the number of that person, okay, by looking at their name. So you can take a man's name, and do gematria and arrive at a number 666, for example. And so it seems roughly that this is looking at that sort of a, a process for identifying the man and the mark. Now, this another passage that talks about the mark of the beast is in Revelation 14, 9. Okay. Uh, in this passage, we read, uh, as follows. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. 
and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here in this passage, uh, in, in the previous passage, we, we learned some of the uh, characteristics of the mark of the beast as far as how to identify it. In this passage, in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, we see that the people who have it, uh, in, in relation to the consequences of it, they're going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, we're going to have to look closely at this because this passage, of course, is going to be helping us answer our question of whether a person who has the mark of the beast can still be saved. Can they repent and be saved? Okay. So we'll look at these, the highlighted parts, primarily. So here's a conditional. A conditional, you know, is an if-then statement. If this, then that. Um, if the dog barks, I'll wake up, right? So the con on the condition that uh, the, the dog of the dark dog barking, I wake up, something like that. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here we have <clears throat> a statement of who uh, is going to basically drink of the wine of the wrath of God in relation to the beast uh, worship and image bearers, uh, mark bearers, okay? Now, there are different ways to read this. I'm going to move the passage over here to the left. And let's look at the mark of the beast. One possibility is that the mark is different than beast worship. For example, if it's something physical. Notice in this passage, we have two things being referenced in the conditional. In the condition, right? Uh, in the antecedent to the conditional. If any man worship the beast and his image, that's one thing. So if any man worship the beast in his image, you can that's theoretically that can be different than the mark. And then the next thing, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So there's your two for, right? Two things. So if one, any man worship the beast in his image, and two, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same, this is the consequence, this is what happens if you do that, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So one reading of this is that you have two things here. If any man worship the beast in his image, there's a spiritual act, right? And something different than the spiritual act, receive a mark in his forehead, uh, forehead or in his hand, say a physical act done to the body. Then he'll drink of the, this person is going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So that's one interpretation, one possibility. Another possibility is that it's basically um, redundant. It's like repeating or explaining. Uh, one part's explaining with, explaining the other. All and only beast worshippers have the mark. In other words, to have the mark is to be a worshipper of the beast in his image. Okay, so let's read it that way. If any man worship the beast and his image, which is to say is a person who has the mark of the beast in his forehead or hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Okay, now historically, people have fallen on both sides of this uh, divide. Uh, more recently, this position, the physical uh, position, the, the mark of the beast is something physical, has is, is become more in vogue. Classically, historically, uh, not so much. It wasn't uh, understood that way often. It was usually uh, taken to be that they're the same thing, right? This, to be a a person with the mark of the beast is to be someone who has, uh, who is who's worshiping the beast in his image in some way. Okay, whatever way is being referenced here, and that not necessarily that's not necessarily uh, overt act of worship, like bowing on your knee and saying, you know, Caesar is God, whoever Caesar is, whoever that's Antichrist uh, is, whoever the beast is. Right? It's nothing. It's not necessarily not necessarily something like that. It can just be some more generic type of worship. So we have a variety of options. We're going to keep looking at those in the future. I'm not going to take a side here. I don't think we need to in this video because I'm focusing on a single question here. Uh, 
and just laying a little bit of groundwork for us to understand it better. And that is, can you be saved with the mark of the beast? And so here, what we're going to do is we're going to explore both possibilities. We're going to say, well, if it's this one or that one, you know, what would we be able to say about this? Okay. Um, in, in, in relation to whether you can be saved having had the mark. Now, let's look a little here. Um, the two ways you can get this all and only would be if it's identical, that's what I've already referenced. So worship the beast in his image and, which is the same thing, receive his mark in his forehead or, hand, or in his hand, or by necessary consequence. I guess you could have it as something like that. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his uh, forehead or in his hand. In other words, saying, if you receive the mark in his forehead and head, uh, by necessary consequence, you are worshiping the beast in his image. Maybe you could get that, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. I'm, I'm throwing out theoretical possibilities here. Um, but yeah, so that's one way to get this. Now let's go back to the different than. Uh, either worship or have the mark. I guess you could read this passage as either or, in one perhaps, or both and. So either or reading would be something like this. If any man worship the beast in his image or receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, that's I'm just throwing that out as a, a possible logic of it, but it doesn't actually work because it says and, right? I mean, the, uh, the other way is both worship and have the mark. If any man worship the beast in his image and have the mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Okay. Um, so I've laid out basically our possibilities. We can focus mostly at this level right here. We have the, there are two different things, worship and, and some sort of mark, a physical mark or uh, some other mark, but that is distinct from the worship or worship is the mark. Now let's dig in. And answer the question. So first off, let's think about the physical side. In Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew 10, uh, the evangelist here records Jesus saying this, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak in, uh, speak ye in, in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And here's the key verse. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now this is important. Okay. This part right here. Jesus is distinguishing God from humans. He's saying, you don't need to be afraid of humans. They cannot destroy your soul. They can kill your body, but they can't destroy your soul. There is no act that a human can do that can damn you if it is through physical interaction with you. So this is, this is an important observation, right? When we're thinking about the mark of the beast, especially uh, this option right here, whether something physical would be sufficient to damn inevitably a person. So if the mark is something physical, what, what could happen? If it's just something physical, then it doesn't require an act of worship or consent even to get it. I mean, somebody could come up from behind you, hit you on the head with a stick, and inject you with whatever it is that's the mark, right? Are you now doomed to hell because you've been injected? Can, can they inject something in you that's actually going to change your will, your mind, and make you inevitably damn, damnable, right? Impossible to save. Can they make you a different species so that you're no longer capable of being saved? Are they able to do something like that? And Jesus' answer is no. You, they may make you sick. They may leave a bump on your head. They can even kill you. They can torture you along the way and make it really, really miserable. They can even make it hard for you to continue in the faith through temptations, uh, torture, abuse, things like that. They can do all sorts of things that are terrible to the body. But they cannot change you 
internally in the soul to be damned. Okay, so that's an important thing to realize. There is no physical act that anyone can do, whatever, with the, a mark of the beast or not, that necessarily damns you on account of that being applied to you. That's impossible, biblically. Because if it were possible, then this passage is meaningless. Okay, then man has become like God able to destroy both soul and body in hell they can't do that and we're we are prohibited by jesus christ of being afraid of that we're not allowed to have that fear because that's a, that's a fear that enslaves us that that's a, that's not a healthy fear okay so one thing that we don't need to be worried about is being inevitably damned on account of a physical mark of the a physical thing being done to us tattoo barcodes chips inserted, uh, uh, injections of whatever other substance, nanotechnology, nanoparticles, trackers, uh, gene therapies, and none of this can damn you or make it impossible for you to be saved. That is not biblical uh, at all. So that is one thing to say, and that means that if the mark is physical, there can be nothing about that that necessarily damns you. So let's say it be, it's a sin to get the mark, uh, to get whatever it is, a chip or whatever it is, a shot, anything. And afterwards you realize, oh, I was duped. Or, oh, I, I wasn't thinking clearly. I made a huge mistake. I should never have done that. As long as the act of getting this did not involve the unpardonable sin, which would not be the physical act, but let's say your will, let's say you have to blaspheme the Holy Spirit explicitly in order to get the mark, knowingly with you know, malice and forethought or whatever. Okay, if, if, if that were required and you commit the unpardonable sin in the act of getting it, well, then you're not pardonable because you're guilty of the unpardonable sin. Uh, and Incidentally, if you're guilty of the unpardonable sin, you're never going to want to go back. So it's not, a, not something to worry about. If somebody says, oh no, if I commit the unpardonable sin, then they haven't committed the unpardonable sin because they want to go back to Christ. If you want to repent and you truly desire it, uh, Christ and you love Christ and you want to go back to Christ, you don't have to worry, Did I, am I, am I for, not forgiven because I committed the unpardonable sin at some point because I was a bad person and I said some terrible things and uh, you know whatever. No. If you're guilty of the unpardonable sin, you'll never be returning to Christ ever. You won't want to. Um, but if that's the case, it's not because of the physical act. It's because of your will, your sin, what was inside uh, you and, and the way you uh, blasphemed the Spirit. Now, the physical act cannot be responsible for necessary damnation, cannot damn you like that. Now... Let's look at this. Here's a passage about the unpardonable sin. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Anything, including accepting a physical mark that, that's uh, a mark of the beast. Okay, or the mark of the beast. If, the, if you had that, that's forgivable. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, to get an idea of what this sin of against the Holy Spirit is, it helps, I think, to look at Hebrews 6. Okay, this is a sin that is not possible for the truly regenerate or the truly saved person. Uh, it is, however, possible for people who are informed, who know the faith, who know about Christ, uh, who experience Christ, know, seen as miracles, for example, like the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Israel at the time of Christ, uh, when he was uh, in his earthly ministry, all of that. It's uh, here. Then this, what we'll find is that if you have some tasting of Christ, experience of Christ, of, of the faith and these sorts of things, okay, uh, and then you renounce it with blasphemy, that's renouncing the work of the Holy Spirit on you. 
right? And that's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And if it comes with enough uh, force, okay, and enough of a renunciation of Christ, it's impossible to go back and hear to repentance. Here it is, Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. See, Here, here's the uh, sort of the influence and work of the Spirit in a person's life and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So you see what's going on here when we look at the unpardonable sin, that you can have somebody who's experienced the faith a bit, Right? They've been partakers of the work of the Holy Spirit and, and the, tasted the heavenly gift and, and have been enlightened in the faith. They've been taught. They've learned. They've seen these things. They understand it, and then they renounce it completely. They're apostates. They abandon the faith like that. That's the act of blaspheming the Holy Spirit that makes it impossible for them to be renewed again unto repentance. See, they're not able to, they're not able to repent. So if you can repent, if you do repent, well, you didn't commit the unpardonable sin. That's pretty simple, right? If you repented, you did what would be impossible if you had committed the unpardonable sin. So, therefore, you didn't commit the unpardonable sin. Now, who cannot commit the sin? It's impossible for who to commit the sin? Beloved. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Though we speak about the impossibility of uh, returning to salvation after returning to the, the repentance after falling away from the faith with after the state of knowing all of this he says that is impossible to return that's terrible sin but you know who can't do that I'm, cons I'm sure it's not going to happen to you beloved because this is not the sort of thing that can happen to someone who has salvation it's not one of the things that accompany salvation. Okay? But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and the things that accompany salvation. Better things than falling away. Things that accompany salvation. The sorts of things that make it impossible for someone who's truly uh, converted, repentant, saved. It's impossible for them to fall away like this. Okay, So, um, Paul, or the author of Hebrews, is saying that uh, uh, basically, hey, if somebody's in a state where they have experienced the Holy Spirit, they've experienced the faith, they un understand some things, they're enlightened, they taste the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, uh, and then they fall away from the faith, they throw the Spirit out. There's your blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, It's like they're saying, let his blood be on us and our children. At that point, after everything they've known and experienced. There's no way for them to return to salvation. And then, to make sure they're not, the, the, the Christians reading the letter don't get in a panic. It's like, oh no, you know, what have I, he says, I'm not saying that that's what happened to you. I'm, cons I'm sure of better things for you, that this isn't happening to you. Things that accompany salvation. And he uses the term of affection, uh, calling them beloved. Okay, uh, so, this is what we see. But the point here is that's the unpardonable sin, or at least a description of it, where you can sort of see it illustrated. The unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's the only sin that cannot be forgiven. And it is a sin that is committed by someone who's experienced some of the operations of the Spirit in their life and, and ministry of the Spirit, and then falls away from it after tasting that. Okay, Now, Going back to our passage about the mark of the beast and who's going to taste the drink of the wine of the wrath of God, we can fill, look at this a little more analytically. Okay, We're going to treat it like a logic. Uh, we're, we're going to examine it, the logic of the conditional. Um, and here it is. If a any man, one, worship the beast and his image, and two, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the conclusion of the consequent, so is your antecedent consequent, uh, the same shall drink 
of the wine of the wrath of God. So you have two things. And I'm going to use an ana analogous one for basketball, just so we can uh, show how this, the logic works. If any man is over seven feet tall, athletic and durable, and two, shoots the three-pointer well, the same shall have a career in the NBA. All right, because you're not going to find many seven feet tall, athletic, durable, three-point shooters. Okay, uh, so these guys almost always have a shot at the NBA. Okay, uh, now, let's take a look. This conditional about the basketball, even if the person shoots the three-pointer really well, if he's really short, 5'2", he's not going to have a career in the NBA because you have to have both of these, one and two, for the conditional to apply, for the consequent to follow, right? So if any man is shoots the three-point well but is under seven foot, he hasn't satisfied the antecedent. He's not, this is not true. Part one is not true. The conditional is not satisfied, and so he, you don't get the consequent. Now let's look at the mark of the beast one, right? So here, if we have a case where somebody has, they both have the mark of the beast, but one guy worships the beast and the other guy doesn't. This guy who does not worship the beast he got the mark, some physical mark. Let's say it's a physical mark. We're assuming that for this example. Okay. If he has the mark of the beast and he repents, he says, I'm not going to worship that beast. That's stupid. That look so ugly <laughs> or whatever, right? He's like, I don't want to be a part of the system. And he gets out and he repents. Nah, he may have to suffer some consequences temporally or whatever because of the mark. However, if he's not worshiping the beast in his image, it doesn't, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. The mark is not sufficient to entail the consequent, okay, to in, ensure that the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Because if somebody had the mark but repents, then it's exactly analogous to being a great three point shooter who's five, under seven foot tall, under five, you know, five foot two or whatever. He fails to satisfy this, so he has no assurance of the NBA. He fails to satisfy these conditions, and so there's no assurance that he shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Okay? That's the idea. And so uh, if the mark of the beast, we can say this, if the mark of the beast is a physical mark that is distinct from worshiping the beast in his image, okay, the physical mark of the beast, having that, is not sufficient to damn. A person can repent and be saved, right? First, we know from Christ's words it's not the unpardonable sin. Secondly, and it doesn't entail the unpardonable sin. Most people, for example, uh, when they, if at least, for example, if it was a certain shot recently, right? Most of those people are taking it because they think it's a, 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 a vaccine or a health treatment or something that's going to be for their good and medically they're getting advice from doctors and well, they're not renouncing the faith in any way knowingly they may be naive they may be accepting something uh, perhaps uh, that is the lies of the beast system and that's destructive and uh, shows a lack of discernment or things like this perhaps maybe they've uh, sinned along the way in negligence and study or understanding what's going on or being stubborn and not listening to friends or family who know better maybe they, they, there can be lots of things like that and certainly if it's bad for them it's going to be bad for them whether or not they understand you know uh, it, it's the unpardonable sin and they're going to have to live with that but as a physical thing, it's not the unpardonable sin uh, to take it. And also, it would not be uh, the unpardonable, uh, I'm sorry. And also, uh, it would be giving too much power to the creators of the, uh, the therapy uh, or the mark, if that's the mark, and it's a physical thing, to say that the mark damns them intrinsically. They don't, nobody has the power to damn you with a physical attack. 
Okay, so we can eliminate that. Okay, let me keep going. Where am I at? So our options here. Uh, the mark of the beast is different from worshiping the beast, and someone is damned if either one they worship the beast in his image or they get the mark of the beast. That's just exe exegetically doesn't work. The either or interpretation is an and. So we'll get rid of that. So our only other options are the mark of the beast is different from worshiping the beast, and someone is damned if both they worship the image and gets the mark of the beast. Let's say a physical mark. Okay, if that's the case, then you have to actually be a beast worshiper for this to apply. Okay, so you're, the, the physical mark isn't sufficient. You have to have both. Third option, one has the mark of the beast if and only if one worships the beast and someone is damned if, S, or someone, if he worships the beast and his image, thereby ipso facto getting the mark of the beast. Same thing. Yeah, that, that would also be a possibility. But here's the thing. You can have the mark and repent. If you're if you're a beast worshiper, let's say a loyalist to the beast, or uh, you're a person who is a super patriotic, gung ho supporter of the beast system. You may not even know it's called the beast system, but you love it, right? You're a big supporter of it. You, uh, and that's a type of worship of the beast. Let's say now, if you're a beast worshiper in this way. You have the mark of the beast, either in your actions or um, in your behavior, or maybe even, you know, are outspokenly a supporter, and so you have it metaphorically on your forehead, right, for everybody to see, unhidden. If that's the way to understand the mark of the beast, you can repent of it as well, right? And you no longer have the mark of the beast by repenting. You turn from the sin, and you're no longer a beast worshiper, and so again you can be forgiven so we've eliminated the only option that would possibly make it the case that the mark of the beast is a surefire way to hell uh, guaranteed uh, in so far as that you're not redeemable and cannot be saved or repent uh, our only other options are ones where a mark is only damning if you're a worshiper of the beast and if you cease to worship the beast and repent of that then you can be forgiven and the, you could get an unpardonable sin with getting the mark of the beast if, if somehow, uh, this is totally theoretical, I don't know how you'd get this, but um, uh, the mark of the beast were either something physical or, yeah, were something like a physical entity received. But in the act of receiving it, you have to qualify. Let's say the beast system requires you to qualify with some action of worship that explicitly involves committing the unpardonable sin. The difficulty with that is I don't even see how anybody could coercively put you in a situation where you would commit the unpardonable sin like that. I, the unpardonable sin is not something you just like choose to do. You know, somebody, I think there was a while back when there was a campaign on YouTube or something where a bunch of people said, you know, I'm going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and they did that, and they thought they were being funny or, you know, um, you know, making some sort of statement. Uh, most of the people who would do that, e even if they're trying to commit that sin, right, in that way, uh, most of those people have no theological background in the faith. They don't know anything about Christianity or they have very little knowledge of Christianity except for, you know, maybe the insults they saw on the Simpsons as children. Okay, uh, they really have little to no understanding of the faith. They have no experience. They have not tasted the, the Holy Spirit. They have not had any experience. They weren't like the Pharisees that watched Jesus raising the dead or, or um you know, healing withered hands and, and all of these right in front of their eyes and knew full well what they were dealing with and then renounced him openly, blasphemously afterwards, renouncing the work of the Spirit of God in their lives uh, right there but that was before their eyes, making them to see these things and experience all of this, right? That's not what most of those people did. So I, I, I can't even see a situation where you could come up with a, a a device like if you wanted to be you know Aleister Crowley and company and they're like hey how can we make everybody who gets the mark be sure they're going to hell and they're like I got an idea let's make them blaspheme the Holy Spirit and then get it we're like we'll kill you if you don't but you're gonna get this mark and you can't buy or sell without the mark and for you to get this you have to sign this paper that says I hereby commit the unpardonable sin or something 
and blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and I do all this. If somebody who signed that afterwards goes home, and for the first time in their life, they read a Bible, or they hear a message from somebody who's a Christian neighbor and said, I'm not going to get that because it's the sin. And they're like, what does that even mean? And, they, and you explain it to them. Now they finally understand, like, oh, crap, did I, did I actually do that? What, what, what have I done wrong? Am I, am I damned? Right? Now all of a sudden they got a conscience for the first time. Now they're starting to become aware of it. I, I don't think they even committed the unpardonable sin. Even they tried. They don't even understand. They, 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 they never tasted uh, of the heavenly things first. They have no clue what they were doing. For them, it was just a piece of paper they signed off on or you know, some words they uttered or uh, a, a horrible, but a gag they put up on YouTube or whatever. Okay, and so again, I, I, don't, I can't even imagine a case where you could pull it off. But if you could, if they could get that, then maybe you could make the, you know, the mark of the beast be something that's in some sense unpardonable because, and again, it wouldn't be in virtue of being the mark of the beast. It'd be in virtue of being uh, the requirement to commit the unpardonable sin beforehand. Um, but again, I just, I don't see how that, that I don't think that's even plausible uh, from an ethical or theological perspective. I don't, I, you know, I'm talking the, um, uh, how you could actually m make somebody do that, even with some requirements. There's no ritual they can go through to guarantee uh, that they've committed the unpardonable sin without, like, having them spend, you know, time in church beforehand or study lots of theology and then say, now do it. You know, I, I don't know what they would do. So, um, okay, so I've rambled. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, so not this. All right, so that, that's where we're at. I think, so to answer our first question, just getting started on the mark of the beast, okay, this is very early. We're in the preliminary stages. We haven't even looked at what the beast is. Uh, we haven't spelled out any details. We're just doing sort of a logical analysis of the language of the mark of the beast in relation to the punishments that come from it uh, and also in relation to other things we know from Scripture about physical acts not of others cannot damn us as well as the nature of the unpardonable sin in Christ's language and the exclusivity of it. There's only one unpardonable sin and there, there's no plausible interpretation of receiving the mark of the beast that makes it the same thing as the mark, uh, as the unpardonable sin. And so therefore we can conclude just at the beginning, our answer to the first question is, uh, the question is, can someone with the mark of the beast be saved? And the answer is yes. Uh, someone with the mark of the beast or who has at one point or other had the mark of the beast, can repent and be saved. So that's important, especially um, if, if any of you have, uh, are of the mind that right now the mark of the beast is live and current in the world. Um, and I know there are people out there who believe that. And, and we're going to explore whether that's right or not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that there is a, a sense in which that's the case. Uh, and in fact, I'm quite confident, positive, the Mark of the Beast is actual right now. Um, though it may be a little different than what some of you are thinking, uh, I may be saying there. So don't uh, don't make any inferences yet. I'll explain. I, I primarily think of the Mark of the Beast as a spiritual act, like the worship. Okay, So I do think beast worship exists already. Um, but but uh, the answer to this question then is, yeah, people at, who at one point or other had the mark of the beast can repent and be saved. And there's no other plausible interpretation or answer to this question. Um, and if I'm wrong, let me know down below and, and comment, like, subscribe, share. And let's keep uh, continuing on this mark of the beast study and try to understand this better. And along the way, a lot of other things and elements, key elements of biblical eschatology. All right. Blessings.